cinema quickly learned to make people laugh. What started out as simple slapstick grew into the richest visual comedy the screen has ever known. From it emerged four great comedians. Harry Langdon, Harold Lloyd, Buster Keaton, There were two great comedy producers in the silent days, Max Sennett and Hal Roach. Max Sennett uh, was um, an Irish blacksmith before he was an actor, and uh, Roach was a truck driver before he was an actor. So uh, we had a little something in common. We were both Irish. And uh, we were, despite what the press said, we were friendly. Max Sennett developed the style of knockabout comedy that's still known by his name. He had a broad sense of the visual ridiculous. And he played that to the hilt. I mean, in the early days of broad slapstick comedy where you threw everybody and everybody fell down like the Keystone Cops and things like that, the Senate was a master of that kind of comedy. Thanks to machinery like this cyclorama, Senate studio came to be called the Fun Factory. Senate was embarrassed by the praise heaped upon him. As he admitted, I stole my first ideas from the Pathes. The Pathé Frere Company were pioneers. The French had specialized in trick films from the very beginning of the cinema. They were the advance guard of the art of picture making. Pathé made this chase comedy about a runaway balloon in 1907. Max Sennett was given the lead by D.W. Griffith in The Curtain Pole, an American version of the French chase films. <laughs> Gr 
Griffith assigned Sennett to direct comedies. He absolutely worshipped Griffith. He'd walk with Griffith about 23 blocks from Griffith's home to the, to the Biograph studio every morning and walk with him back. He wanted to hear the master talk. He wanted to listen to him. And, he'd, and, he, and uh, yes, he worshipped him, absolutely worshipped him. The Senate left Griffith to set up his own independent company, Keystone Comedies. He appeared in many of these himself. Based in Los Angeles, he took every advantage the city offered, like this 1914 military parade. Senate saves money on extras, and on actors, too. He plays the director himself. Senate had a remarkable ability to spot talent. The young lady with the powerful kick is an English comedian named Charlie Chaplin. A great many of the comedians working for Senate were English, and a great many other comedians that were working for other people over here were English. And uh, because the vaudeville music hall pantomime uh, shows in England produced a great many very fine comedians and comedians. And I think that uh, as far as uh, the visual humor is concerned, that there were more of it produced in England than any place else. One of those Englishmen was George Harris. They put me through tests and tried sorts of moustaches on me. You always had to have a moustache, you know, with you with Senate. And inside of just a few days, I became almost one of the family. When I first got onto the Senate lot, Mr. Senate said to me, I'd like you to go up in the story department. And uh, I said, but Mr. Senate, I've never ever written for the screen, never done anything. He said, no, just sit with the boys. And if you hear them talking about something that reminds you of something that you had seen in an English pantomime or an English vaudeville sketch, you mention it to them. We never wrote anything. It all, everything was spoken. He'd, he'd divide us up into twos, and we'd have to have a get up a story for this for this comic or for this comic or for that kind. We were assigned to various comics. And we had to bring up a, a story of some kind. Our story was very simple, usually just a closed line to hang gags on. There was uh, the old-fashioned pratfall, which is almost self-explanatory. <laughs> you either went bump and you're behind, or you go a little higher and hit on your back. And the trick is in those days, if your form wasn't high enough, you'd say, uh, I want to see a little more light, please. And you'd have to go higher. Then there was a stiff back, where you'd be walking along the street, and a fellow would come out of here with a, a broom, hit you right in the face, and you'd do a stiff back. You wouldn't move your feet. Your heels would stay right where they are, and your shoulders and heels hit at the same time. Then there was 108. That's the old fall where you're walking along the street, and you step on a bar of soap. You go up in the air, and you lay out in the air like that. It's flat. Boom, and you come down. Of course, the flatter you land, the better it is for you, because it's, it's not a one-point landing, it's an all-point landing. And those were the three basic falls of the old comedies. And if you couldn't do those, you couldn't do comedies. Even the, the, the gals used to do them. Some pretty damn good prep falls. Senate so loved the art of making pictures that he was happy to parody his own methods of production. Oftentimes when they were shooting exteriors, if there happened to be something going on, uh, I, uh, one day I remember there was a fire, burnt two or three buildings. So they rushed the cast of characters over and, and later they'd write it into a, to one of their future pictures. Senate had a direct link to the fire department. When the call came, the crew dropped everything including Ben Tappen. Senate 
tonight we'll shoot any spectacular event and work a sequence around it. was a simple yet complex. A simple man, in which his deeds were simple, but he, he had the sort of complexity that he needed butlers in full dress suit around him all the time. And he, did, he needed to eat with a black tie. And yet he, he looked ridiculous in the black tie, and so did, you know, his butlers looked ridiculous in their, in their livery. He had a tremendous library of, of books, when I finally opened one, they, you know, they, they, the, the leaves never been opened. They just bought them by the yard. And the, the, uh, he had this strange quality of being simple and yet try, trying to be sophisticated. And he, he certainly never made it. Never made, he never made it sophistication at all. Sophistication was not the reason audiences loved these films. Here is Charlie Chaplin in his very first film, produced by Senate in 1913. Chaplin has yet to create his screen character. Senate insisted that Chaplin do the knockabout slapstick his audience expected. Chaplin wanted to make subtler comedies. He left Senate in 1915 and a year later signed with Mutual for $670,000 a year. He was now the highest paid comedian in history. Chaplin's years on the stage made him a storehouse of English music hall lore. George Harris came from a similar background of music hall and pantomime. Well, Chaplin, in my estimation, is pantomime. I think his every, his every movement, his every motion is, was, was pantomime. Pantomime itself is really uh, action without words. And after all, said and done, remember, Charlie Chaplin made his name and became a world figure without any talkies, just as a silent artist. great film comic before Chaplin was the Frenchman, Max Linder. Linder showed how to hold the camera eye with movement alone. Chaplin learned from him and acknowledged his debt. In 1918, they met at the Chaplin studio and Chaplin had it filmed. Linda did Chaplin. Chaplin did Linda. London, 1921. Charlie Chaplin had become the most popular figure in the world. Chaplin, he's really unfathomable. You, you, can't, you can't pin him down. He, he is, his talent was so great and uh, so varied. He could do anything. And if he didn't know how to do something, he wouldn't say that he didn't know how. But don't show up the next day because he could tell you everything about it or do it better than the guy that originated it. 
This man was a great tumbler. He had great control of his body. Strong. Oh, immensely strong. Had the ability to do anything with his feet or hands or head, torso. He could do all these things and do them so well. If you said what when you were watching Chaplin, you were lost. All you could do was just watch him and just try to catch him. Jackie Coogan's father was a vaudeville comic. And one night, Jackie joined him in the act. In the audience was Charlie Chaplin. He was showing me off for the benefit his fr of his friends. And it went over terrifically with the audience. And Chaplin, being a man of instant emotion, said, I've got to get that kid. He got him. Jackie Coogan was four years old. For a while, Chaplin didn't know what kind of film to make with him. He showed him off for visitors to the studio. This rare piece of film is from Chaplin's own archive. Chaplin saw in Coogan something of himself when young, for he too had been a child performer. Gradually, the shape of the film formed in Chaplin's mind. It would be different from anything he had done, a comedy with dramatic sequences. Chaplin's own London childhood, when he was taken from his mother and placed in an orphanage, was the inspiration for the kid. He had nothing going to give on. He was his own boss, and he took the most precious thing in the world, time, and lavished it on the picture. As everyone knows, Charlie wore a crepe mustache, and they used to stick it on with spirit gum. And we had several close, very close scenes, and this glue has a sort of an offensive odor. A lot of the times, we're just sitting around. He wouldn't even be in, in costume without, a, without an idea. And suddenly he'd get this idea and he'd disappear and get his makeup on and put the mustache on. And it was fresh. And that odor would come through from that glue. And uh, that was all, always associated with, well, it's time to go to work. small boy has been looked after by the tramp since he was a baby. Now the welfare authorities are going to take him away. man comes and says, are, are you the father? And uh, this, that, and the other thing. Well, I've got to, he's got to go into a hospital. And they take him by force and it to be put in a, which was practically condemning a child to death.
And I can remember him explaining to me what he wanted me to do. Then he also explained why he wanted me to do that. And he said, because, Jackie, it's this little boy is being torn from his friend. And as he started to dramatize it, I saw it by my mind's eye. He was a marvelous storyteller, narrator. But he put it on an intensely personal basis. So that when he said camera and then action and the welfare worker throw me into this truck, that's when the, uh, the dam broke. Of course, I was, uh, I was really gone, man. I was, I was torn up. Uh, I want my daddy, I, I, I was hysterical. And if you are gonna be, portray yourself being hysterical, you better get yourself hysterical. Look, brother, it's, it's as phony as a $3 bill. starts out of this Model T Ford to take me to the uh, orphanage hospital and Chaplin pursues us over the rooftops. Well, he had, he had a good idea. That was a different kind of a chase where the, the pursued are in a car and the, the poor pursuer is on foot but over the rooftop. That was where the uh, scene reaches its emotional peak because we're both crying, real tears. And to see this great clown that uh, people had always seen, you know, as a mischievous tramp, uh, really crying was uh, a real shocker to most people. But he couldn't leave them there. So he had gone from tearing your heart out to knocking him in the aisles with it. Because the greatest relief is laughter. Taking nothing from such great clowns as Harold Lloyd to say that Chaplin laid the foundation on which they built their success. With the feature-length comedy, he gave them fresh scope to display their genius. Lloyd began his comedy career as a Chaplin imitator. 
But once he found his character, he became the one comic who seriously rivaled Chaplin at the box office. almost got me down as a stunt uh, comedian because uh, the films that uh, I made that had thrills like that in had a real impact and they remember those but actually out of nearly 300 films that I made somewhere between 250 and 300 I only made five that had thrills like that that's a small amount from the beginning of his career Lloyd was closely associated with Hal Roach well Harold Lloyd and uh Frank Berzaghi and I, for instance, they made a colossal three-reel picture called Samson. And we were the three eunuchs, the witnesses of the birth of Samson. Lloyd was not a comedian in those early years. He was just another face around the studios. He hoped that makeup would win him substantial parts. But old men and idiots were not much in demand. He finally popped up in a series of Hal Roach comedies, co-starring B.B. Daniels. His character, Lonesome Luke, resembled Chaplin's too closely for Lloyd to stay with it for long. I felt that I had gone as far as I could with those comedy clothes characters, and they weren't satisfactory to me. I was too much like all the rest. Charlie had complete control of that category, so I wanted to get away and be something different. We had a, a, a guy that did a great drunk, and one day, and doing a drunk, he came on the set with a pair of glasses without any rims, without any glass in them, and he looked very funny with these things on, and that's where I got the original idea of the glasses for Lloyd. Much to the disappointment of Passé, we changed the character from Lonesome Loop to a straight character, the only identification were the glasses. That character was almost a media success. Lloyd found his mark not by looking funny, but by looking serious. Glasses give you an academic appearance of a studious man, but you don't necessarily have to be that. You can belie that appearance. You may get into a scrape and they think you're very studious and you do something entirely to dispel that idea. Well, you become a funny character because you're not doing what they expect you to do. You, you get into a situation you don't act as the normal person acts. My character, just to think of it, it was the glasses and an ordinary clothes you wouldn't think is a funny young man but you see one picture after another and finally he becomes a very funny character to you portrayed a character and that's exactly what acting means is portraying a character and not playing yourself and he built that character when he ran it looked like he was running as fast as he could and he did anything it looked like he was doing it with great enthusiasm
hot water, Harold wins a turkey in a raffle and takes it home on the streetcar. But there's another problem he fails to notice. Mr. Keaton approached his comedy with deep solemnity. Not smiling was, was mechanical with me. I just didn't pay attention to it. I learned from the stage that I was the type of comedian that if I laughed at what I did, the audience didn't. just automatically got to that stage where the more seriously I took my work, the better laughs I got. of all, the most intellectual of all, he was a stoic. He never changed expression, no matter how life treated him. He always accepted the good or the bad or whatever it was, he accepted in one way, and that's with a certain tolerance for what it was, the stoic.
always joked that a cyclone was raging when he was born in Kansas. His parents were vaudeville entertainers, and Keaton joined them on the stage at a very early age. My old man was an eccentric comic, and as uh, soon as I could take care of myself at all on my feet, he had slap shoes on me and big baggy pants and then just start doing gags with me and especially kicking me clean across the stage or take me by the back of the neck and throw me. And by the time I got up to around seven and eight years old, we were called the roughest act that was ever in the history of the stage. Buster Keaton never had a double. I've heard a couple of fellas say they doubled him, but I have never seen this happen. This man was a very clever acrobat. I don't believe, knowing his bust as well as I do, and doing things as good as I used to do, I don't believe I could have done them like he wanted them. He knew what he wanted. His fall was a different fall. He just didn't uh, slip and fall down. He'd do a lot of things before he fell down, you know? And he's built into it. And that's the way Buster was. And you, you can't double a guy like that, doing those things. Keaton's pictures were always elaborate and sometimes flourished into an epic grandeur. His most spectacular picture was The General, a Civil War story in which he plays a locomotive engineer. When his beloved engine is stolen by northern raiders, he sets off in relentless pursuit. The leading lady was Marion Mack, he, he was used to production and understood production. Uh, he understood uh, the important shots, where to shoot from, and he knew exactly what he was going to do. But no one else knew what he was going to do before he started a scene, hardly ever. Keaton is now caught up with the enemy, and he decides to open fire on them. and I had planned to make some scenes later on, some close-ups. My hair was perfect and everything. And they told me to, to go into the scene and pretend like I'm helping Buster. Of course, I, in this picture, I was always supposed to be sort of a dumb Dora type of a gal that was trying to help Buster but getting in his way. So they said, when Marion gets in the proper position, let's let the water spot go and knock her down. I didn't know that they were going to do it. So that scene is not acting because the force of the water was very great. 
was good that we didn't have sound movies <laughs> at that time. <laughs> Buster Keaton planned his gags with the absolute precision of an engineer. For he was not only a great comic, but a great comedy director. first independent release, Keaton proved how well he knew his audience. I always wanted an audience to outguess me. And then I'd double cross him. Keaton worked on a wide canvas. Harry Langdon was a miniaturist. His style was slow, deliberate, detailed. Langdon did not invent his character. Uh, we invented it. When I say we, Arthur Ripley and I invented it. Because uh, uh, Mr. Sennett had seen his act with his wife on vaudeville and had photographed it and liked this little man. And he was a very slow pantomime actor. And then he brought him to the studio and turned him loose with all the comics and all the Max Sennett comedies. The comics just ran faster than anybody. He got leaped higher. And, and had more bigger pratfalls than anybody else. And here was this childlike ca character that, that took him five minutes to wink, you know, trying to make good in that, and, that, and nobody wanted him. But Senate kept saying, you guys don't know what he's got. He's got something, that guy, see. So it became our turn, R Ripley, Ripley and I's turn, to look at the film and see if we could do anything with it. And we saw it, and we just agreed with everybody else. Uh, just a man, just a small little all-time comedian. And, uh, and Ripley said, uh, I think uh, uh, only, God, only God could help that twerp, you know. Uh, and, th and I had just read Soldier Schweik, the good Soldier Schweik. And the, the connection between the two came, was, was immediate.
we asked permission to, to, to work on it for a while. And we did, and they made the, we made the picture, and the picture was a tremendous hit. This is a true reader. Absolutely a new star was born. A new kind of a personality, you see. Innocence. <laughs> finally became his director. And the first picture I directed for him was a strong man, which I thought was very good and uh, had everything that Langdon could do and do right. went Hollywood in a very big way because he read these wonderful reviews from New Yorkers who went crazy about this man. I mean, and and he, he just went... Poor little man couldn't handle it. Just couldn't handle it. But then he directed himself. Now, his one idea was to equal or supersede Chaplin in Chaplin's own material. In Three the Crowd, Langdon tried to echo the pathos of the kid. Audiences were not moved. I didn't see him for years after that, but next time I saw him, I knew he was working on stage. I peeped in on the stage, and there he was redoing a famous gag that we had in the in, a, in the Strong Man of carrying a woman up on his lap, up up the stairs one at a time backwards. And the director was yelling to him, faster, faster, Harry, faster, for God's sake, faster. And faster was not the thing to say to Langdon. Slower, yes, but not faster. Langdon's stardom was short-lived. Although he kept working, he was quickly forgotten. He never knew, he never knew what the difference between his own character. See, he never knew that Chaplin invented his own character. And knew, and knew Chaplin could direct himself because he knew his own character better than anybody else. But Langdon did not invent his own character. It was invented for him. And that he never understood. And it was a tragedy. Comedy always was a serious business. The silent comics did their best to adapt to talkies. But sound had little use for pantomime. The heyday of visual comedy was over. Bye. 